When we say nebula, we tend to think of those conglomerations of dust and gas that shine like gems in the galactic blackness. Some, like the Great Orion Nebula, are so brilliant and huge that they can be seen with the naked eye. And some, like the Pleiades, are ethereal and haunting, with their glowing blue within blue colors and gems of stars within. Emission nebulae, like the Orion, emit their own light because they are energized by powerful, nearby stars whose radiation ionizes the stuff of which the nebulae are made. While reflection nebulae, such as the Pleiades, bounce the light of stars in the region off the materials of which they are made. But, throughout the galaxy, there is another kind of nebula. Dark nebulae. Collections of frozen, sub-micrometer dust. Too dense and too opaque for starlight to pass through too far from any powerful irradiating sources such as hot stars to be ionized, and, for the most part, with no nearby stars to reflect light off of them. What we can see of these nebulae at all is that which is illuminated by the lights of more distant stars, or, in other cases, they stand out because of the way they silhouette a dense background of stars behind them. I've always thought these dark nebulae have a mysterious quality to them. They are frequently cold places, ghostly and haunting in the shadows, like caverns beckoning in the depths of space. Imaging dark nebulae presents specific challenges. Because they are already very dark, they are best imaged on only the blackest nights. But in the previous week, I was fortunate to have three crystal clear nights fall exactly over the new moon, and then, entirely unexpectedly, part of the following night. And so, the attention of the Sky Story Observatory was focused on LDN-673. This is a large region of dark nebulae that occupies an area of sky several times the size of the full moon. It's actually a complex, interwoven group of several dark nebulae, set against the backdrop of the stars of the inner Milky Way galaxy. The stars in the image appear so dense that they are like a thick, scintillating dust of ruby and yellow tourmaline scattered throughout the image. And there is so much dust and such a concentration of stars in the region that there is little room for the blackness of space. It's almost as if both stars and dark nebulae have been set upon a thin background of pale red velvet. But as noted earlier, shooting dark nebulae presents particular challenges. One is literally imaging darkness upon darkness. And to do this well, dark nights are needed. Not only dark nights, but to do it best, I think, dark skies are needed. And, in this case, I think it particularly helps to be able to capture as much light information as possible, so it's very important to shoot with an efficient technique such as LRGB. When using a monochrome sensor, this gives a significant efficiency advantage in capturing information. It also helps to have a wide aperture telescope, probably a reflector, not that it's impossible to image such nebulae with a refractor. But, when you are literally intending to image darkness, it's especially important to be able to capture every photon possible. For me, living as far north as I do, imaging this target presented another huge problem, despite the advantages of living on a mountain beneath a dark sky, and that at the present moment there was no moon to contend with, summer nights are very short, so imaging time is extremely limited. And when I began imaging this target on May 27, 2025, Nights were only offering about six hours of nautical to astronomical darkness, and as we draw closer to the summer solstice, that time was decreasing rapidly every single day. Now, short nights are the bane of astrophotography, at least as much as light pollution, because telescopes cannot image constantly through the night. I really wish they could, but every hour it must plate solve in center to make sure the target is well aligned. And because I am shooting with a monochrome camera through LRGB filters, it has to change filters through the night. And, each time it changes a filter, it's going to refocus to make sure the focus is appropriate for that filter. On top of that, a dithering operation must happen, and I find a good dithering ratio is 20%, so one in every five images I shoot will be dithered. This is sufficient to prevent walking noise, a kind of noise that, if you get it in your image, is almost impossible to clean up. Dithering also makes for cleaner images because it helps stacking software determine what is undesirable noise versus what is desired signal. So. A little math, every dithering operation requires about 60 seconds. Every time the telescope changes filter, that eats up about 15 seconds, and when it refocuses, that eats up another 2 minutes and 45 seconds. And sometimes the focus fails and has to be redone, but we won't consider that here. But filter changes and refocusing happen on average twice per hour. And once per hour, the telescope will plate solve to check centering, 
and that usually requires about one minute. So it actually requires 79 minutes to shoot 60 minutes worth of integration. So in a 360 minute night, I can shoot up to 273 minutes of integration. On top of that, this target would be low on the horizon when darkness began. It wasn't until 11 p.m. that the DSO would reach 15 degrees over the horizon. Now I know 15 degrees is too low for most people imaging in ordinary circumstances. But because I do have the advantage of a little altitude and living in a dark sky region, and shooting east for me is shooting over the ocean where there's no light pollution at all, I will, when necessary, begin imaging targets once they are 15 degrees over the horizon. And that happened at about 11 p.m. So that was another hour of precious black sky eaten up. Nautical dusk would happen at around 4 a.m., giving me five hours of imaging per night, yielding, on average, about 230 minutes of integration per night. It's actually just a little bit more than that because I slightly rounded up those numbers. So on average, I could anticipate about 240 minutes of integration per night. I shoot 60 second subs, so that would mean 240 subs. But Murphy, that SOB, always gets the last laugh, and it was on night three that the nightmare happened. I woke up on the third morning of imaging to discover that I had not gotten any information whatsoever through the blue filter that night, meaning my image would have a significant shortage of blue information. Obviously, there was a problem with the filter wheel, and as I have a player one Phoenix filter wheel. And as most people know, if they follow my channel, I'm very fond of their cameras. Unfortunately, and I hate to say it, don't get their filter wheel, at least not if you live in a cold climate. It's a complete dud for cold weather. And their customer service is great, but I mean, I've been on customer service with them every few months about this filter wheel. When I first got it, it was refusing to turn if the temperature got below about minus five to 10 degrees here. And living in Canada, that's a problem because that's most of winter. They address the problem by remotely getting into the firmware and cranking up the power on the electric motor. Even then, it would only turn reliably when temperatures were down to about minus 10. That allowed me to shoot through much of the winter, but in the heart of the winter, when typical nights were well below minus 10, it still had to be babysat through the night. Then about four months ago, I noticed that many of the subs were showing the filters off alignment, so I opened up the filter wheel and discovered that the drive shaft had come almost completely out of the electric motor and forced the filter wheel to an odd angle. I corrected that, and now this latest problem just a few months later, for reasons that boggle my mind, the filter wheel is refusing to go to places four and five, where I keep my blue filter and my HA filter. One day it was working, the next day it suddenly stopped. Now, Player One has great customer service, and whenever I contact them, they get back to me right away and do their best to address it, but either this filter wheel is a dud, and I just got unlucky with it, and the rest of their filter wheels are great, or this filter wheel design is a lemon. In any case, I've decided to replace the filter wheel. It's been a non-stop problem since I bought it, and that was only in January 2024. As of right now, I've had the thing maybe 15 months. But I keep maintenance records on my equipment, and that filter wheel has been a non-stop problem since I got it. Anyway, that's enough of that. So I woke up and discovered I didn't have much blue information. This could have been a serious problem, but an analysis of the image indicated there was very little blue coming from this target anyway. To obtain that conclusion, I simply stacked all of my blue subs and then an equivalent number of red and green subs and compared the results. As you can see, the blue image is significantly lacking. Green is also lacking somewhat too. Most of the information is coming on the red channel. And besides, blue is just low frequency information, just a color. I could easily compensate for that in developing. I went ahead and stacked the information that I had. Even though it was only 8.3 hours of integration, well short of the goal of 12 I had set. The lack of blue information didn't help, but the lack of total integration hurt. In particular, the final image lacked high frequency information, which is what leads to the smudgy appearance of the space and the somewhat fuzzy, partially unresolved stars, as well as the lack of refinement in the non-stellar information. This image really needed more integration time, but this is the target I don't get a lot of opportunity to shoot. It's not well positioned for long where I live. However, the weather report indicated that the next day rain was beginning and the rain would persist for at least a week. However, a lucky break occurred the following night. Just before bed at around 11, I happened to glance outside and saw the sky was crystal clear. I popped onto the internet to check the forecast and take a look at the satellite images and it turned out we were right smack dab in the middle of a small window of cloud cover that would persist till about 5 a.m. And this is where it's really handy to have an observatory, small and simply built as it may be. I darted out to the observatory about 80 meters away and about 10 minutes had the roof off and the power on. And in another 10 minutes, I had the telescope up, had done a polar alignment double check, 
and plate solved onto LDN 673 and was imaging. The problem with the filter wheel was still there, but I didn't let that stop me. I had previously locked the filter wheel onto the luminance filter, and it was luminance information that I needed that night more than anything. And then I encountered another problem with astrophotography, that you are perpetually subject to the weather gods. You see, you can have a wonderful clear sky, but still find yourself battling the weather. A stiff breeze buffeted the scope and terrible seeing made things worse. And the first two hours, as I monitored the situation, it seemed like pointless effort. And I was wishing I had just gone ahead and gone to bed instead of opening the observatory. But at about 1am, like magic, the weather cleared and suddenly became ideal. Like, really, really ideal. The seeing became incredible and the breeze entirely melted away. So for the remaining three hours of the night, I was able to get two hours on the L channel. Now that might not sound like much, but if you watched my previous two videos on the advantages of shooting with monochrome cameras, one thing that you would have gleaned out of that is in terms of gathering high frequency information, a monochrome camera shooting through a luminance filter is twice as efficient as a color camera. So in that two hours, I was able to gather a lot of luminance information. Let me take a moment and illustrate the power of that mere two hours of additional information. So, here is the fully developed image from the information gathered over the first three nights, with 8.3 hours of information. Half of that is luminance, and the other half is RGB. Now, I'm going to add the additional two hours of luminance information to this image. The luminance information is especially strong in conveying delicate light and shadow, and in particular, relating high-frequency information. And watch how that further resolves and defines the light, shadow, and especially the delicate detail within this image. Adding it now. Notice the stars are tighter. The delicate differences between light and shadow within the dark and nebulosity are further refined. All detail is further enhanced. And the background space between the stars, dense however they may be, is much more developed, much smoother. Now I still think this image needs another night or two of integration. Hopefully, the DSO will still be well positioned when I get another moonless night. I need to shoot some additional blue information to make up for the night the filter wheel failed and much more luminance information. But as it stands, I think this image is passable, especially given its dearth of integration time. Well, thank you for watching. Those are the adventures and misadventures that make up the many challenges of shooting astrophotography. One awaits the whims of the weather, and brings a dozen pieces of complex, high-tech equipment together, which may or may not choose to work, much less cooperate with each other, all in the hopes of harvesting the faintest traces of starlight. And there is little more challenging than obtaining the information from dark nebulae. Stay tuned, because in the next video, we're going to go about developing this information. Developing dark nebulae is a bit tricky, because your subject is darkness. And I find one should approach developing dark nebulae differently because you aren't so much looking to bring out detail as you are seeking an effective balance between bright and dark so that the light in the region can accentuate what's hidden. Have you shot dark nebulae? What are your own experiences? And how do you deal with those necessities that also eat up integration time, such as filter changes and dithering? Have you found strategies to make that more efficient or just decided that's one of the many bullets we astrophotographers have to bite? And I'm sure any number of you have your own nightmare stories when the gremlins got into your equipment and made it fail for one reason or another. How do you deal with that? I've known some persons who get so frustrated they throw their hands in the air and quit. And other persons for whom such frustrations have led them to devise some intriguing innovations that make things more reliable. What are your own ways of coping with these kind of things? As always, thanks for watching and I look forward to hearing from you. Now get out there and shoot that amazing and amazingly challenging sky.